Uh, what a privilege, to be honest, uh, to watch Alex work. I, I don't think a lot of us appreciate uh, the masterful work that he puts into using constraints. I want you to just mess around. And, and as coaches, you should have permission to be able to mess around. If anyone asked me, for 25 years, so when I was 20, I'm 50, I just turned 50 on this trip. Happy birthday to me. And when I was 25, I did a master's degree where I learned about random and variable practice. So that's 25 years ago, that games approach, game sense, that research is not new. Alex and I didn't invent any of this research. It has existed for a long time. What is new, basketball immersion started in 2014, is that I didn't realize a lot of coaches weren't using it. A lot of coaches are influenced by the way we were coached, right? My coaches made me run and did drills on air drill after drill, perfection drills. And if we didn't get the perfection drill right, what did we have to do? We had to do it again. We had to do it again. We had to do it again until we got it perfect. And apparently that was mental toughness. And that was mental toughness. But we know, look at how these players, and I don't know how many coaches clinics you go to. I go to a lot of coaches clinics. Guys, I've seen very few players at any age, at any clinic, do as well as you've done at this clinic. You should be very proud. You should be very proud. And I don't praise that which is not praiseworthy. So you should be very proud. Because watching those players play, I can already see they play with a joy and a spirit of the game and the spirit of learning. The goal, if you watch my daughter here, the goal is not, does she do it right? The goal for me every day is, is she learning? Is she learning? And we know that learning is messy and learning is not being perfect. And if she can do things perfect, and if your players can do things perfect, then it's your job as a coach to cause them to mess up. And that is the hardest thing about coaching. The hardest thing about coaching is that we want to make the uncomfortable comfortable for the game, but then we want to make the comfortable uncomfortable for practice. And keep that cycle going of making them uncomfortable again because that's where they fight and strive for their learning. And if we can do that, then we're going to have players that continue to grow. And the goal when I assess any player, especially when I think about it, my daughters, selfishly, it's not can they do it, are they perfect at the skill, it's can they learn it, and can they do it. So I'm going to go to th through a whole bunch of things, and I'm going to work these guys out. Uh, the theme is player-led versus coach-led development. And where this comes up is this, it's really simple. Coaches around the world, I feel, I feel you devalue yourself. Kennedy, dribble, 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 boom, 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 bring it, push pulls, whatever, boom, 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 okay, hold. My value is far greater as a coach than doing that with her. And if I am leading her to do that, then I am wasting her time and I'm wasting my time as a coach. My value as a coach is that I can better connect skills and decisions than she can. And Alex has shown you all the different ways you can do that. That's my value for her. Her value to herself is she can do that on her own. And if I'm spending our practice time on that, then we're not doing the things that actually help them play better in the game and help them improve. And your value as a coach is playing basketball in practice, helps them get better at basketball, and you can help them play bas basketball in practice. Right? We know that. So that's your value. If she wants to be a good dribbler, who's responsible for that? You are. I'm not responsible for her being a good dribbler. If you want to be in shape to play basketball, who's responsible for that? I'm not responsible for conditioning. Now, we'll play full court basketball like Alex has showed you. Those guys will be in shape in their practices because we're going to play full court basketball the whole practice. So they're going to get conditioned to play basketball in our practices. But if she wants to do more and she wants to be as good as she wants to be, do you want to be good? She's got to do it on her own. She's got to lead herself. Like as good as coach as I may or may not be, 
I'm not good enough to help her get as good as she wants to be. Who has to help her to be as good as she wants to be is herself. And we got to quit taking the responsibility of that on as coaches. We are not responsible. And there, by the way, there's nothing wrong with telling players and parents that one player is better than another player. And we got to quit. And that's hard coaching, by the way. But Kennedy is better than every single player on her under, under 11 team. Why are you better than every single player on your team? You work on your game. Every day she gets up and works on her game. So you're telling me that I have to now treat that player that never works on their game the same as the player that works on their game? No. We immediately make that known to parents. Your child is going to be as good as they're going to get based on how they lead themselves, not on how I lead them. Just like academics. Now, here's the magic. I create the environment, right? There's no trees in Iceland. There's some. But do you grow the flowers? Do you grow the trees? No, you don't. You create the environment because you take care of the dirt, the soil, by watering it or feeding it, whatever you need to do, and the tree grows. That's the environment I want to create. I want to create an environment where she wants to lead herself. And every one of them leads themselves. Okay? And stop being frustrated by the player that doesn't lead themselves. Right? Instead, focus on the environment and the honesty of, look, she plays more than other players on her team because she's better than them. Well, why is she better than them? Because she works on her game every day. Do you work on your game every day? Do you spend time on your day? Now, here's the problem. We've got to create a condition where they understand what working on their game is. And working on their game is an intimidating process, right? Because every single one of players in America thinks working on their game is hiring a trainer and spending an hour a day on your game. Every single time, every player I ever coached, I said, if you just spend five minutes on your game a day, that's compound interest, right? Compound interest. Put compound interest every day. And when she started trying to get good at basketball, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, that's all she did. All player led. All player led. So what's my role as a parent or as a coach? And Alex has helped me immensely with this in understanding ecological approach. I'm just a rebounder. I'm just a rebounder. So we'll show you some of the things. I'm just a rebounder. So when I come out here, she's going to do things on her own. Now, to start with, she's going to dance and shoot. Ball. Dance, shoot. Now, she's going to do different variable ways to dance and shoot. And I am not going to give her any technical information at all. I am just a rebounder. One foot. I am just taking care of the soil. I'm prescribing something and say one foot, but I'm not telling her what to do. She is going to have the skills emerge through us creating the environment. One foot. Now, can I sometimes say, remind her, hey, be more variable. Hey, can you hop in multiple directions? I can cue her to remind her to do different things, for sure. But I am not, and I'm not going to help her emerge her skills, is if I come out here as a coach or as a parent and tell her, okay, when you take your dribble, point your toe this direction, put the ball here, do this, do this. I've never taught either of my daughters how to do a layup. I told you that yesterday. And the reason is because it becomes a limitation. As soon as I specifically teach them something, it becomes a limitation rather than a possibility. And we know that because if you've coached young players at all, as soon as you teach them a layup and they bring the ball above their head, she's short. Should she be shooting layups above her head? Most of the time, she's got to learn how to shoot the layups outside of her body. So we've got to help them emerge the skills that are going to help them be effective at these ages in terms of that. Uh, so what we do is ideally, 
we present them with a problem. So part of player development is present them with a problem. Whatever you want, but figure out different ways to go between your legs each time. So now she's going to go between her legs each time, and she's going to figure out how, else, how can she go between her legs and be able to shoot. This is all, all emerged on her own. Like I post her on Twitter sometimes, earmuffs, don't listen. And some people like criticize her shot. Like, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. She's now, how old are you? She's now 12. She's 12. Like seriously, if we're thinking about development for a player, when does she have to be a good shooter? Right? Does she have to be a great shooter at 12? No, we want it to start to be shaped. We want it to start to be developed. Ideally, we want it to be all within our body, and it flows. And here's the most important question you can ask someone. How does it feel? Does it feel natural? Does it feel like your shot flows? How does it feel? The constant thing I ask in player development is how does it feel? How does it feel? To me, again, what does not matter is my solution. What matters is her solution. Let's give you a quick example of that. Attack and go between your legs and then attack and go behind your back. So attack, go behind your back as a counter. Cool. Go somewhere else, go somewhere else. <laughs> then attack and go behind your back. Okay. So should I now be the person that tells her she should be going behind her back or between the legs? Or should I ask her, which one do you like better? Between the legs. Which one is she going to use more? Probably between the legs. Yeah, we want her to develop both. But ultimately, players develop a preference based on what feels good to them. So should I be stubborn and say, you must only go? And this is the way we used to be coached, right? I used to be coached this way. You must only jump stop to pass. Never leave your feet to pass. Right? Uh, you must always pass with two hands. Right? All these musts are limitations. As soon as you prescribe something, you limit something. So and that's what Alex is trying to show you. We're not trying to coach all the little technical, tactical details. Hashtag, what is it? Micro skills. There's no micro skills. She's a basketball player. It was beautiful yesterday. And I'll tell you, every place I go to in America almost when I ask kids what position are they, like whether they're 8 or they're 16, they will tell me a position they are. And I tell them all, my goal for all of you is to answer that question next time someone asks you and say you're a basketball player. I'm a basketball player. And that's the game. And that's where I'm really, really impressed by all of you and your players because every one of them plays like a basketball player and not a position. And that's beautiful. And that tells me that Iceland basketball is on the right path. And you've already shown that, like with the levels you guys play at, with the population size. That's beautiful. So keep that going. And that's what we're trying to do every day. When I'm just a rebounder, yeah, sometimes I'll say solve this problem. Okay, uh, you can take a dribble any direction you want, and you must go backwards, sideways to shoot. So now we can help different things shape. I'm just a rebounder. We'll figure it out. And gradually, she'll learn how to do this. And this is exactly how she's learned how to do all of these things. Never once have we sat there and said, OK, when you do a step back, every time, let's do 10 repetitions. You go here, you go here, step back, and shoot. Now, sometimes if she struggles, I can intervene and I can demonstrate. Sometimes I can provide an example. Okay, sometimes, mostly, I can ask a question and say, listen, when you go step back and you go straight back versus you go step back and you go to the side, what do you feel? What's different? Which feels better? And help them find the solution. That, to me, is player development. And that connects to what I said yesterday, which is mini conversations. I can't do that if I don't have mini conversations. And we just have, con don't we talk constantly? Like, I think my favorite time, I have so many favorite times with you and with Presley. But I have so many favorite times with Kennedy when we're just, I'm just a rebounder. 
Because we can have so many mini conversations, right? Just mini conversations where we get to connect. And that to me is what I used to do with my players at the college level. The player development part was about connection. It was about mini conversations and connection and helping them obviously develop some comfort and confidence, but also help them come up with some solutions that work for them. And we help evolve those things. What else was I going to show? Anything else in terms of that? Cool. All right, guys, get a partner, get a ball. Come here real quick. Stay here. Stay here, Ken. Just come here. Move in a little bit. Here, here. Four, three, two. I'll show it with her just because she's done it before. This is called shoulder gain. Shoulder gain. So at some point in terms of player development, as we said, it's not about just doing it in terms of individual player development, it's also connecting skills and decisions at the same time. BDT, basketball decision training, is mind training. Zero seconds, Alex referred to it yesterday, is skills training. We cannot separate zero seconds from basketball decision training. One is mind training, one is skills training. As I said yesterday, you can't separate those two things. It is perceive, decide, execute, feedback on what happens. So everything we do. Now, in an individual player development workout, or sometimes in a team workout, which we'll do here, we can bridge the gap. Bridge the gap between on-air and full, live basketball. Well, why do we need to do that? Sometimes we do because we need to be able to get times for them to help shape their skills and be able to develop some of the things that they're going to be solutions for them. And I'll give you those things right now. But everything's based on a decision. So guys, defensively, arm length away, because a good defender can cover someone arm length away. And this is also defense is about perception, right? If my arm's out, perception is what? She has space or no space? She has what? Space or no space? My hand's down, does she have space? My hand's out, she's got what? No space. So I'm trying to take away space on defense and she's trying to create space on offense. Head below her is generally a sign of someone being in a situation where they're playing defense. Okay, put your feet together, put your feet together. Okay, this is no wide. There's nothing you do in basketball with your feet together. One wide is whatever one wide is for you, shoulder width or round shoulder widths, whatever feels good for you. That's generally shooting position. Two wide, go one more step outside your body and then squat. Two wide is dribbling position and generally defensive position. So if I go too wide right now, my head's below hers, my arm's out, then I look like I'm playing defense, right? Why is that important? Why is playing defense or acting like you're playing defense important? What are we trying to shape? What, what are we trying to shape? The offense. So if the defense doesn't compete, the offense doesn't get better. So remember yesterday you got the impression that I don't care about defense? I care about defense. Because you know what defense does? Really good defense helps offense get better. Okay, when do you have to be a good shooter? After 14 or so, because that's when they get past puberty. That's when shooting really, really gets to that next level. Because until then, I don't know what, what's going to be shaped through puberty here. She might end up being six foot. She might end up being this height. So a lot of things change through puberty. So that's generally what we say. And it also gives her permission to be able to fail. So we try and normalize the fact that I miss shots, she misses shots, we all miss shots. That's part of the learning process. And go from there. So it gives her time to be able to learn and focus on learning rather than success. Right? Are you good at that? No. Terrible at that. But we'll work on that. It's all fun. She wants to make every shot. Of course she does. She's a human being. want to make every shot because that's the fun of the game. All right, but we want to normalize some of these things and go from there. When do you have to be a really good defensive player? College. College. Until then, we want them to play defense. Don't get me wrong. But the complexity of defense at your level probably, you know, as you get to under 16, under 18, that's when the complexity of defense really comes in with peel switching and all these things Alex went through, right? But over that, before that, most of defense comes down to effort. So we want them to learn how to compete. We want them to compete on defense and try to prevent them from scoring. Basically, a good defender can stop one dribble drives. A great defender can stop two dribble drives. When I watch most of you play, most of you didn't stop one dribble drives. Right? So think about that. If I can 
if she can attack and beat me on one dribble, that's bad, right? We all agree? Because we're forcing rotation and help. Okay, if she attacks and I can make her counter once, that's better. And if I can cover two dribbles, then probably she's passing. I've done my job. And that's how we define it for our players in terms of those things. Can you cover one dribble, two dribbles, okay, or no dribbles? <laughs> that's also a bad problem. But we'll talk about that another day. Okay, shoulder game. Arm length away here, I toss her the ball. Every time I toss her the ball, she fights for her feet. So all that means is she catches it with two feet, however you catch the ball, ready to shoot. Here, if I step back, what does she have? So what does she do? Shoots, because that's the decision. The decision we want to shape for all players is that when they have space, they shoot. They shoot when they're open. In range, in rhythm, and they shoot, okay? She doesn't know when she's going to shoot, but when she steps back, she shoots. I rebound the ball quickly, I work for her, I get to a spot, we go from there. I step back and she shoots. Okay, any rim, go, any rim, go. I don't know if there's an extra, but you're fine. Okay, cool, thanks girl. Yeah, next. I'll bring you back, go sit down for a second. Go, whatever you want. Okay, hold. So a few things. Number one, shoulder game is on YouTube, basketball immersion YouTube. You can see great examples of it. Shoulder game, basketball immersion YouTube. But when they catch the ball, they obviously can't dance with the ball in their hand, can they? I know you have the zero step, but I think that's still a travel, right? Okay, so they're working on getting their feet, however they get their feet, to be able to shoot the ball. Some of them were asking where they can shoot from. I would always shoot threes. If that's a range, shoot threes. Right? Pete Carrill, famous coach at Princeton, all they did in practice, and he was ahead of his time with the philosophy, but all they did in practice is shoot threes. That's all they did. They never shot another shot. Because he figured if they can shoot threes, they can shoot from anywhere else. And part of that philosophy is right in the modern game. Threes and layups, Alex emphasized those things in terms of getting in the circle. So if they shoot threes, we shoot from three, otherwise we want them to shoot their range and go from there. Okay, can, quick, quick. Okay, now you can add a second decision. Well, really a third decision. Hands out, pass back. Step back, obviously shoot, because she has space. Hip turn, means she has space to be able to drive. Now, the constraint is, cannot score a one foot layup. So no one foot layup. So you can score anywhere you want, anywhere you want in the smile, or around the smile, because Alex has emphasized that, but no one foot layups, okay? So it'll look like this. And then she does something off of some type of finish. Now, if you want to go ahead, if you want to prescribe very specific finishes, the only thing I would say is give them possibilities rather than musts in terms of shaping that. Okay, must, mu you guys can go, you guys can go, I'll talk through you. Must stop a one two stride stop, and then there's possibilities from there. They can turn on a shot, or they can step through or do different things. So we try not to prescribe something because that becomes a limitation, but we can evolve it from there. Okay, hold, here, Ken. Counter, so the fourth decision is I reach and gap and she attacks. Okay, look at my feet real quickly defensively. So defensively, this is defensive technique as much as anything, is defensively, I am pushing backwards or crossing back, and I'm jumping to create a gap. Why do I want to create a gap on the dribble? Why do I want to create a gap on the dribble? If I create a gap, she's always shooting between me and what? And you're doing a good job, because what is she not getting to? It's a game of opposites. Alex said on offense, where do you always want to get? Smile. And if I don't let you get to the smile, I did my job on defense. Like really, you could evaluate your defense just based on how many shots are shot with a defender between the ball and the basket. And isn't that basic basketball? Ball you basket? That goes back generations. That doesn't change. If I can do that, then we can get better. Come here real quick, Kennedy. We're going to add all four decisions. So here's how we connect these things. 
These four decisions are all the decisions that we use for player development and understanding player development and team development in terms of decisions related to dominoes and advantage-based basketball. Arm length or more than arm length determines shoot or pass drive decisions. Shoot or pass drive decisions. If she has more than arm length advantage, what does she do? Shoots. And if she has less than arm length advantage, then it is pass or drive. Off the dribble, dribble. If she has shoulder to chest advantage, it's obviously her advantage, she wants to keep leveraging advantage. Maybe she keeps going because she has space for speed. Maybe she has to angle me out because she has advantage there. But she has shoulder to chest advantage, that's offensive advantage. What's defensive advantage then when she attacks is chest to chest is defensive advantage. So she now has to counter. She either counters with a dribble or she can counter with what we would call a protection plan, which we can get into, Alex, I don't know if you're going to cover, you want to cover protection plans in the next one? I also cover protection plans for you because it's the part of basketball that I think has really evolved and helped create situations where we are constantly fighting for that dominoes, and if we're neutral, we can always get out of neutral to be able to create an advantage again and be able to play from there. Okay, so all four decisions. Quick, 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 quick. Two and switch, two and switch. Shoot two and switch. Your partner shoots two, then you shoot two. Just quick. Okay, hold. Okay, so now how we, can we load this? Because it's my job to make the comfortable uncomfortable. So now every time we're doing it with our player, we're moving. So ready, you're gonna move with me, move with me, move with me, move with me. And now we can go and play from there. Stop. On any drive, the player that makes them drive, cues them to drive, I can relocate to space. I can move to space. So I must move to space. And if my hands are down, what are you doing? Score. But if I put my hands up, what do you do? Pass. And now you relocate. And you are always the shooter. And now if I run at you, what was that the cue to do? To drive right? If I run out to you with my hands up, what do you do? You pass, and now it's pass and cut, and it's a get. Yes? I don't know if they were here yesterday. When I shut up, they can start. Same idea. Okay, now hold. The most obvious thing is, do they look like they're even playing defense? Right? And, and that, that honestly, there's two things I think you could do. If you're, if you're coaching young levels like Kennedy's age, I believe I can pick, if there's 100 kids in the gym, I could pick the five best players in the gym very easily by seeing who can go three times between their legs and shoot the ball smoothly. Efficiency and effectiveness at going three times between their legs. The other thing I can determine is the five best players, probably in terms of defensive effort, based on who's in a stance. Right? And do we have to? Do we have to Drew Drills slap the ball to teach him a stance? Do you want to be a good defensive player? Get your head below him and be arm length away. That's, that's my determination right now of you being a good defender. Who's in control of that? Okay, let's do it. Go. Relocate, though. Make to, go to space. After they drive, move to space. So you could add your penetration reaction to this, whatever your penetration reaction philosophy is. Push, pull, fill, whatever it may be, and play off of that. Quick, 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 quick. Cool. Good. Shoulder game on YouTube. Okay, hold. Offensive player starts with the ball. Watch, offensive player. You did kill the grass, right? Kind of? Okay, remember kill the grass? I don't know. Did you call it that? Stay alive. Stay alive. Okay, kill the grass, stay alive. Just do as many dribble moves as you can. Really quick. Okay, now, hey, 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 wait. Awesome. But just ready? You put up your arms. What does you got to do? Put out your hands. Accuse them to what? Pass. Right? Give it right back to them. Kill the grass. Go. Kill the grass. Go. Put up your hands. Put up your hands. Okay, hold it. Watch, watch. You're too you're too good. Go, go, kill the grass. Quick, get it to me. Quick. 
play, right? Same cues. So whatever dribble moves you want, you can do the same cues. And you add these cues because what are you adding? Perceive, decide, execute. Okay? Hold. What does Kennedy not do yet with her eyes? What does she not do with her eyes? Yeah. So early in learning, I don't care if she dribbles and looks down. Because what do I want her to get comfortable with? Dribbling. Now, as she evolves, she's got to get better at keeping her eyes and using her eyes as fakes and different things like that. So they get used to doing that. So dribbling with hands up, hands down. Stationary dribble, go. Okay, hold. Doing that on your own. But if you have a partner, do stuff where your partner's involved, hands up, hands down, because it makes you perceive, decide, and execute, which is game-like, and play off of that, okay? Uh, cool, do it with the dribble. Do it with the dribble to start. Go, kill the grass with shoulder game. Whatever you want, good. Good, sprint, sprint, sprint to space. Sprint to space, right? Because he wants to potentially pass to you. Okay, go, go, go. Perceive, decide, and execute. Okay, hold, hold. Here, come here, right here, right here, go. You're gonna go to another group, ready? Get back there, go again. Cool, ready, start. Okay, skating, so skating is this. Side to side with the dribble. Lateral movement, lateral movement. You're gonna skate, same thing, you can make them pass, or you can make them drive, or you can make them counter. But now we're plus one at the rim. You can relocate, still put up your hands. You're protecting the smile. So heels, we call it heels. I'm not sure what you call it. We call it heels, meaning you're defensively, you're the MIG, you're protecting the smile. You obviously want to not let them get in the smile, so you get your heels outside and protect it. And you're live, right? So if he scores, is that good? So we don't want him to score, okay? Skating, make him do whatever you want. That's all good. Let's go. It's great effort making a mistake. Hands, 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 good. Get it back to him, quick. Good, drive. You relocate. Okay, now hold. He didn't have his hands up, so you gotta go, go from there. So, it loads a bunch of things, and the number one thing that we're trying to get him to do is, are you trying to pass? Passing is a secondary decision. What's a primary decision? Score. Passing is a secondary decision. So we want them to attack to score. That's the mindset of this. Okay, groups of three, plus one at the rim. And Look, any drill, you guys can go, 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 go. Uh, any drill you do, you can load it by adding a plus one. And generally, that's what you saw with Alex's stuff and any type of player development stuff. And again, when we, Alex and I talk about player development, it's very rarely one on zero. It's almost always in groups. Whether it's pro players on down, it's really hard to develop at the game without the game being represented. And you can only represent the game where you have other players. So we don't do on-air, one-on-one workouts. And if you are a basketball trainer, which I don't know if that culture exists here as much, it's just a bad business model to have one player in the gym when you can have four players in the gym that are paying you, right? It's a better business model to have four than one. So if that sells it, then we'll go with that. Cool. So he's always the shooter. Who's, who's the player? Go again, go again. Okay, hold, just watch down here. Okay, do it, hands, pass, just pass. Start with the ball, pass. Fight for your feet, fight for your feet. Okay, yeah, every time, catch the ball. Catch the ball, ready to play. Drive, drive, move. Yeah, you're always the scorer. Good, switch, go, figure it out, rotate. Go figure it out, let's go. Boom, 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 let's go, quick. Yeah, pass, cut, play, play, get him. Go get him, go get him, ball screen, go, 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 attack. Yep, and now they're playing one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, why do players miss layups? Why do players miss layups? Because, mostly because we practice so many layups without perceive, decide, and execute. Like, we, if I practice a layup on air, my only perceive, decide, and execute is based on the rim. But we all know that when you shoot layups, with the exception of an open court steal, it's... I must perceive, decide, and execute relative to a defender, a teammate, before I even look at the rim. So if we're practicing on-air layups, we're removing a lot of the key features of what actually determines the decision about whether to shoot the layup or not, so we're not practicing the way that they actually shoot layups. And that would be a big part of this. 
Okay, watch. Uh, come down here just so you can see. Four, three, two, one. Stay there. You come right here. Get underneath the rim. Here, get underneath the rim. Come here to the smile. Right here. I got ball. I'm going to beat you for a second. Dream come true for me. Thank you. Okay. Perceptual layups. Perceptual layups. Here's another way to work on layups. Perceptual layups. The first part of this is on YouTube. Perceptual layups. The two, three, four loads to it are not, and I'll show you that. Okay. I'm going to start under the basket. Smile. You guys can both do it on the same basket. That's fine. I'm going to run at you. You're going to run at me at the same time. So we're going to move at the same time together. So when I move, you move. Okay, move. I'm going to throw it. Now stop. I step forward. I step to a side, and I stand still. You are not allowed to dribble, so you must score without a dribble to start with. Okay, watch it. After I do that, step, step, stand, I go to a different spot, and then you would rebound it and throw it to me, which would be you, right? Okay, ready? Ready? Go. No dribble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go get... Good. And then I would go somewhere, you'd rebound it, and now you'd throw it to me, and we'd move, and I would have to try and figure it out. Okay, I made the shot. There, put that on film. Okay, go try it. Um, it takes a little bit initially to get the rhythm of it for the players, but the defender, all they're trying to do, step, step, stand. And the initial thing is they'll move somewhere because they want to get to their shot. All we're trying to do is add perception, decision before layup. So they have to perceive, decide, and execute before the layup. So instead of their visual gaze being on the rim, their visual gaze is initially on a defender. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You are a guided defender. Just step, step, stand. We should be getting layups. Hold, hold. That was excellent down there. You should be getting layups. So when I catch it right now, I should be getting a layup every time. Right? I should be getting the rim. We're not shooting floaters. Yes, there you go. Good. Figure it out. Different spots. Different spots. Figure it out. And part of it is you see the defenders are moving after. Just step, step, stand is the initial part. Okay, hold. Now you must dribble. Must dribble on the catch. Dribble on the catch. Alex is big on this as a helping shape multiple types of pickups. And you see trainers, 100,000K views on Instagram, working on a low pickup and a high pickup and an outside the body pickup. This is just helping shape all those things without actually teaching it. Okay? Okay, no, no, steps, step, forward, hold, step forward, step to a side, stand still. Step forward, step to a side, stand still. Cool. Okay, hold. Now add a plus one. So now what are you protecting? Protect the smile. So now you add the plus one to it. Got to be moving at the same time. We're moving. Moving to the ball. Move, move, move to the ball. Move to the ball. Don't wait for the ball. Move to the ball. Move to the ball. That's better. That group down there has it the best if you want to watch it. The group in the corner. Except for the fact that he just turned away there. But everything else is beautiful. Cool. Okay, hold. Here, give me one, one of you guys at that rim. Come here. Four, three, two, one. One of you come here. Leave the ball. Leave the ball. Four, three, two, one. Go out there on the wing. On the wing. That is the slowest, fast pace I've ever seen in my life. Great urgency. Okay, do the same thing. Actually, hold. Uh, I, I really like you, but get out of here. Go. Uh, and get out of here. Go. Give me two whites down here just so they can see the difference. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay, go. Go. Same thing. Same thing. Good. Play. Play. Watch. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Same thing. Figure it out. Figure it out. Keep going. Mix it up. Mix it up. Okay, now hold. If your teammate or if the player outside, by the way, puts up their hands, what do they got to do? Pass. Pass triggers two on two. 
So whoever catches it on the perimeter, if it's a red player this time or a white player, then that's a team on offense. Now, what they should be doing each time is rotating who's out in the corner. Okay, Alex talked about this a lot. I don't know if you have players that just stand off the whole time and don't ever sub themselves in. That is a conversation with the player. That's a mini conversation. Do you want to play basketball today? Do you want to get better at basketball today? Sub yourself in, right? And for rotations, we spend no time teaching rotation. We don't ever tell them, oh, well, this player goes to this spot, this player goes to this spot, this player. Yeah, it's messy. Yeah, it's ugly. They, yeah, they don't figure out rotation initially. But we want them to have player-led situations where they can lead themselves and follow themselves. And if they really struggle with it, what does Alex tell them to do? Take a timeout. Figure it out. Okay, Get it, figure out a rotation and figure it out from there. But everyone's got to switch a spot each time, right? There's not a permanent corner. If they don't put up their hands, it's just a normal situation. Moving, moving, moving. Yeah, moving. Did you see his hands? Good, good figure. Okay, whoa, whoa, talk, talk, talk. Use your voice. Do you like being the guy standing in the corner the whole time? Figure it out. Talk to each other. Talk to each other. You can talk and play. We shouldn't have to take a time out to figure out how to rotate. That's it. Figure it out. Figure it out. Okay, now hold. 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 Okay, so initially in learning, you see how like, they're like this? They should be passing. But initially in learning, if they're struggling with it, we talk about hands out being arms extended, just so it's obvious. But after that, it will become less obvious because they'll be looking. But what it makes them do is obviously when they're catching the ball, they're perceiving the defender, they're perceiving the rim, and they're perceiving a potential pass, right? And all this is to be able to build player development in terms of building perception and decisions, right? And the load is there. Can we build this to four on four, five on five, three on three starts? Yeah, of course we can, right? And it's essentially what Alex did yesterday with the high five in terms of starting from uh, advantage type start where there's some type of advantage in play from there. Let's see if you can figure it out. He's going to have his hands up, so pass it and play 2-1-2. Two, two. Play, 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 play. Okay, now hold, hold. That's your teammate. You're white, he's white. Yeah, it's random. It's completely random. We don't know. It doesn't matter right now. As soon as it passes, passed out, it triggers 2-1-2. Two, two. It's going to be completely random. If you haven't figured out how Alex coaches, it's very messy and it's very random, isn't it? Right? And what do they have to do? Figure it out. They've got to figure it out. It's a long closeout. It's a short closeout. You can put a constraint on the player where they must drive the ball, where we say it must drive the ball so it triggers some type of two-on-two -two off the drive, off the of dominoes. We can put a constraint on where it triggers what we would call three-pass one-on-one, which means three-pass one-on-one. Can I have the ball real quick? Can I have the ball real quick? Okay, I'm going to pass to you. You pass right back. One, two, three. So it, they arrive closer, and it becomes one-on-one -on -one close versus one-on-one -on -one far. And it triggers those different things from there. Okay, try it again so we can maybe get a rep on film that looks like we know what we're doing. Are we having fun yet? Figure it out, figure it out. Play from different spots. You've only played from the same angle. Play from different spots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. You, no, 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 no. You forgot perceptual layups, yeah. Perceptual layups. Start again under the rim. You got the ball. You got the ball. We're both moving. You're trying to score a lap. Go. Score a lap. No, 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 no. You must be moving at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perceptual layups. Yeah. Move, move, move. Score, score, score. Good. Now figure it out. Rotate, rotate quickly. Different spots. Figure it out. Go. Good. Now, see how we caught it? Stationary. We don't want that. We want them all moving because we're working on the decision at the rim in terms of layup, drive decisions and play off that, but go look at it on YouTube. It looks a little bit better. Um, Alex has many variations of this on basketball immersion, if you're a member as well. Perceptual layups. Tons of stuff, tons of fun to do off that. Okay, hold. All right, uh, go down there for a second. Uh, get that other ball. Go, four, three, two, one. You guys can do it down here. Just, you guys can do it down there, but watch. No, uh, no. You didn't like that ball? Ah, doesn't matter. Oh, by the way, um, 
I'm just a rebounder. We had a backyard hoop at my house. Uh, if you see some of the videos, if not, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter and you can see some of the videos in our backyard hoop. We're blessed to have a nice hoop. And we're blessed to have sun all year, sorry. Uh, but we can change the height of the hoop. And one of the variabilities that I introduced without ever telling them is we constantly change the height of the hoop. Even at this age, I'll constantly change the height of the hoop. So there's variability in terms of that. Alex will tell you the science about that in about an hour seminar on all the science behind that. But the other thing we do with them is we constantly change the ball. Like we don't use the same ball every day. Because again, it's variability. And I don't know if when you get to college, especially if they play in the United States, they will play almost a different ball every game. That'll be a Nike ball. You have to use the Under Armour ball. You have to use the Spalding ball. You have to use the Baden ball. I mean, it's just crazy. You use a different ball all the time. That's why I love Europe. We use the same ball. Anyways, that type of concept. Okay, watch. Must score in the smile. There's two balls. Two balls. This is like two balls, three shooters. But this is also like animal. We introduced yesterday this concept of animal. And right now, okay, ready? You guys got a ball. If you got a ball, you're trying to score. If you got a ball, you're trying to score. If you don't have a ball, you're trying to get a ball to score. Yes? Make sense? So if you got a ball, you can score. 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 Get a ball. Got to get a ball. Keep score. Score. Yeah. Score. Keep scoring. If you got a ball, you can score. Got a ball, you can score. Keep scoring. Got a ball, you can score. If you don't have a ball, get a ball. Don't have a ball, you can get a ball. Hold. Hold. Must take your ball outside the free throw line each time. Must still score in the smile, but must take your ball outside the three, uh, free throw line each time. If you got a ball, must take it outside the th free throw line. No, you got to take it out. Yeah, got to take it out. Now you can stop them however you want. Good, good, good. Chaos. Just the free throw line. Just the free throw line. Okay, now hold. Uh, you know, we, we, but you already know because Alex has gone through all the different variations of constraints you could do there. We can only. Must score off two. Uh, I, I don't know if you did it today yet, but no rim or you must use the backboard, or you can't use the backboard. Different ones like that. Um, just variations of kind of scoring and finishing and being competitive. Can we add more players? Of course we can. Can we add less players? Of course we can. One of our favorite things to do, everyone get a ball, everyone get a ball, get outside the three-point line, let's go. Everyone get a ball, get outside the three-point line, go. Four, three, two, one. If you got a ball, we're all down at this basket. We're all down at this basket. Must score in the smile. How many points can you get in the next two minutes? Got to bring the ball outside three each time. Go, go, you can go. Must bring it outside three. Figure it out. Got to bring it outside three. Get one shot. If you miss it, you got to bring it outside three each time. Okay, hold. This is one of my favorite starts and stops in practice is to be able to do things like this because, again, it creates intentional chaos. It creates messy. And it also creates, it used to be something that was unsafe, right? As coaches, this is very unsafe. You must have one player only go in for a layup. And then I thought about it, and we've thought about it quite a bit, and said, actually, it's much safer if they all go in for a layup at the same time because their attentional awareness is much more focused. Right? It's much more focused. Now, also, what's always the answer? Does anyone remember what always the answer is on offense? Space. So if you're driving in and there's four people in front of you, what should you try and find? Always seek and find space. No, you all have a ball. Also, now, can we say, hey, when you get outside the three-point line, you must make two-dribble move. When you get outside the three-point line, any type of two-dribble move before you attack. Only one shot. One shot. If you miss it, get out. If you miss it... Okay, hold. The hoop problem aside. Uh, also... Alex was really good at this. Alex was really good at this, obviously. Every time they didn't call score, what, what, did they, what happened? They don't get a score, right? And, uh, you know, the only other part I'll add to that is, say it's reds against white, reds against white, and we're playing five on five or something like that, I will ask red what white score is. What's the white team score, right? Because, again, you never play basketball without knowing the score. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of these competitive kind of mindset type things. But that's one of the things. We want them to know their score. And by the way, if I stop right now and I said, what's your score? 
Three, excellent effort answering without a pause. Because he may be lying, but he acted like he wasn't. Right? But if they pause at all or they say, um, then like you don't know your score. Whatever you say, you're lying. And it's great, right? It develops this confidence, this mindset of, I know my score, I know my score, and I should know my score because basketball, you never play without knowing the score. It's always on the score clock, so we should know it in practice all the time. And if you have a parent in the gym that's sitting there, then put them on the clock and have them keep score because you've got to put them to work. Put parents on your team. Generally, they want to be on your team anyways in terms of that, okay? Uh, last thing. Uh, no, I'll save it for a little bit later. Uh, last thing, okay. Uh, Memory consolidation. So, this is a concept, why do I even forget? Somebody on the basketball podcast brought this up in some context, and then I researched it a little bit, and th the term that they were talking about was called memory consolidation. It's moving something from short-term memory into long-term memory. Kennedy, are you good? Can you come back? Where is she? Can you get a ball? Come back? Thank you, guys. You're awesome, but hold here is what you're going to do. When you go get water right now and you go chill, don't steal all the food yet. Coaches eat first, right? Do they? In Iceland? I'm joking. I'm joking. You guys have been amazing. You get to eat first. But wait. When, before you go there, find a partner and tell them something from Alex's session that you learned that can help you be a better basketball player. Memory consolidation is moving something from short-term memory into long-term memory, meaning I retain it. And part of that is that you muck around with it, you interact with the material. So it's that practice of going, what did I learn and what helped me? And being able to communicate it. We'll also do different ones where we have gratitude moments. Go tell a teammate something you're grateful for, for them for. Kennedy, I'm really grateful for you for participating in the clinic. Like you go and you tell some, something you're grateful for. So you have these gratitude moments. You have these learning moments. You have these struggle moments. Kenny, tell me something you struggled with today. Cool. Eyes up. When you, cool. We want to bring awareness to the learning process and things that they did well, things that they can improve on, and then things that they're grateful for for their teammates. I told you, I don't know if Presley and Kenny probably won't demonstrate it because they're sisters, but they all have unique handshakes. Like, we want them to have their identity with their team, but we want them to have their identity with their teammates individually as well in terms of that. Okay, mixed drills, real quick. Okay, this concept of retrieval. Alex, do you mind just rebounding? Just rebound, Alex. No constraints. <laughs> See if you can handle that. Okay, Kennedy's going to just do a whole bunch of different mixed drills. So she's going to go between her legs. She's going to go behind her back. She's going to do one foot to shot. Just do all the different things, Ken. It's all good. Uh, really, the point is mixing. Are you talking? You can't help yourself. I know. She, she's been sitting the whole time. She's all good. She'll figure it out. It's all good. Now, the idea, hold. Ken, you're good. Ken, hold. Okay, mixing and learning. So here's what we see a lot on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter. The world of basketball player development is the world of repetition. The world of doing something over and over again until you can repeat it in consecutive reps. Look, we don't want to go into the research, block versus random practice. Block practice, yes, it helps you early in learning, potentially understand. Yes, it helps you maybe on the first few reps get an idea of what you're doing. But beyond that, what it doesn't lead to is retention. And the goal is learning. The goal is not being able to memorize something. The goal is learning. And learning is stimulated by the retrieval process. Meaning, instead of telling her to go, okay, Kennedy, on that spot, on the elbow, okay, go between your legs, facing the rim one time and shoot. Just keep doing it. Shoot. Alex will pass it back to you. Shoot. Between your legs, shoot. She's going to do 10 reps. 10 reps in a row. 10 reps in a row. 10 reps in a row. Okay, hold, hold, hold. Instead of that, okay, each time you catch the ball, do a different dribble in a different direction, anywhere you want, and shoot the ball. Okay, now... What that does is that stimulates a retrieval practice. What did I learn? 
what did I learn about my movement? What did I learn about moving backwards? What did I learn about moving sideways? What did I learn about dribbling behind my back? What did I learn about this? And each repetition is like this retrieval of what I experienced before. And that's the idea of all of the mixing, interleaving, interweaving, this concept in education. Hold, Ken. This concept in education. So if Kennedy was going to come out there and do anything with me, or any player was just going to work with me, instead of having them shoot like an NBA pre-draft workout where they shoot 25 shots from the same spot over and over again, they're going to do variable shots or random shots each time. Because that is more representative of the game. To me, that's good. Now, if I have Kennedy and she's really struggling, don't you hate it when we do this? And we say, go to a spot and shoot from the same spot over and over again. Sometimes we'll do it to remind her that she can shoot. Because if she goes to the same spot and shoots over and over again, what is she going to get really good at? Shooting from that spot. And she's going to feel real good about herself. Just like at the NBA pre-draft workouts, when you watch a player hit 24, 25 threes from the same spot, well, don't you expect any NBA player should be able to do that? Right? Otherwise, like, what the heck? What are they working on? They haven't been leading themselves. So instead, we want to represent the game and have variability in our workout. So mixing and player development is a big part of this, and we would do that all the time in terms of that. Thank you, Alex. Great rebounding. No constraints. I know she's a, she's a wonderful girl, mostly. You're amazing. Thank you. Cool. Go from there. Anyways, let's eat. Uh, I, I just want to, again, reiterate, uh, thank you for being here and being attentive for Alex and I. I don't know about you, but when Alex presented, at least from my perspective, I have a ton of notes. If you're interested in some of my takeaways from what Alex does, I'd be happy to share them as well in terms of that because I think it would be interesting to be able to interact with the material. I think Snorri is going to send you a little survey at the end of this as well, which I just want to say it because I remember it. We would love to hear your feedback on what some of the takeaways are from this experience. Whatever they are, good, bad, ugly, whatever they are, it's beautiful to be able to hear and get feedback as well. Also, Kennedy, hi. Uh, if you would be so kind, Kennedy, and you feel confident enough, Kennedy would love to interview you on video. You don't have to. Safe environment. So if you completely mess it up, I'm not going to use it. But I know you won't. But if you're open to the possibility of just being interviewed, we're going to do a little mini documentary on our experience in Iceland with you as coaches and with your players as well so that we can help share the game, not just our, from our perspective, but also from your perspective as well, and help promote what you guys have done here, which is incredible as well. Because um, you brought a Canadian and a, a Brit. <laughs> I know a Brit to Iceland to share the game with you, and we've been grateful for that experience. So if you're open to that possibility, Kennedy uh, will have the camera and be able to do it from there. Okay, so thank you for that. Enjoy your meal. Thank you.